All right, we're now recording. Thank you very much for joining the second 2019 Wednesday webinar. Glad to have everyone here today. We're gonna to be talking about what to grow in an urban market garden, but before we get started, we'd like to say thanks so much to our sponsors of the Women in Ag program, as well as recognizing the collaborators of this program down at the bottom. Couple of announcements. We do have some Annie's Project classes that will be coming up on the Midshore and in Southern Maryland. That information is available on the website, as well as information on the 2019 Regional Conference. It's our 18th annual Regional Conference, February 12th and 13th, um, that will be in person at Dover Downs uh, in Dover, Delaware. And the link is there. Here in blue are the homepage for the Women in Ag programs. We have our whole list of 2019 webinars coming up, events coming up. So you can check that out. You can also view recordings from previous webinars on there. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn today's session over to Nia Little. She'll tell you a little bit about herself. Uh, she'll start sharing her screen now and um, Talk about what to grow in an urban market garden. So thanks so much, Nia, for being here today. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Shannon, for having me. And thank you, Taylor, for the support. Uh, my name is Nia Little. I work for University of Maryland Extension as an extension agent for urban farmers. Um, so it's my job to do teaching like this and technical assistance and um, applied research that's relevant to urban farmers. And we'll get a little bit more into what urban farming is if this is a new concept to you, but I do recognize some names in the attendee list. Um, so I think some of you are, are familiar already. I'm going to start sharing my screen so you can see my slides. There we go. And this button, I think, there we go, makes it presented. All right. Hide that. All right. Um, again, I'm I work with urban farmers. I'm based in Baltimore, Maryland. I do want to make a plug. We've got an urban farmer winter meeting coming up this Sunday afternoon. Um, so if that's something you're interested in, uh, check out, there's an urban ag website that I'll give you a link to in our resources at the end. And you can find it there. So today uh, we're going to talk about what to grow in an urban market garden. Um, and this is one of the questions we get asked the most, what can I grow? Um, so let's Let's get started, but first off, a little bit of, of context setting. What is urban agriculture? This is a picture um, of White Lock Community Farm in Baltimore, and I think it's a great one because it shows kind of the diversity of urban agriculture and kind of the consensus, the consensus definition of urban agriculture is very broad, that it is all types of growing of plants and raising of animals in an urban setting, um, whether it's you're raising food or things that are not food, like flowers, whether you're growing things for yourself, your family, what, or growing them for sale. That all falls within the definition of urban agriculture. In this picture, um, if you start in the front, you can see some uh, raised beds that are part of a community garden, and then behind that you've got some in-ground rows. Uh, there's okra and tomatoes, and then behind that is a high tunnel with some, some shade cloth on it where they're raising crops um, kind of on the, the corners of the season in the spring and the fall in particular. And in the back you can see some of our row houses in Baltimore. Um, and for more, uh, I, there's another, I spent a whole one hour Women in Ag webinar on this. Um, so if you go back through the archives, you can dig a little bit more into what urban agriculture is if that's of interest to you. But what is an urban farm? Um, and that's kind of what my job is to, is to support people in particular who are who are urban farming or who are growing for market or for sale. Um, often people, especially lenders, ask me, "What acreage? How big does a farm have to uh, does a, a a garden have to be to be a farm?" Right? Um, and I think that's kind of the wrong question usually because the size that you're of, of acreage that you're working with varies a lot um, depending on what you're growing, right? If you're raising pumpkins and watermelons, those are big sprawling fruits. If you're raising grains, you probably are raising hundreds and thousands of acres of corn and soybeans. Um, but if you're raising 
lettuce that you're cutting by hand and selling directly to your customers, you're probably on a much, much, much smaller, uh, less than an acre even sometimes. So the acreage, I think, isn't really as helpful in defining what is a farm. Um, the USDA usually has some cutoffs in terms of how much money you are making, how much income you are generating from your sales. Um, and for my purposes, when I'm working with people, whether, when I decide whether I'm the best person to try to help them or whether someone like a master gardener is a better person, I usually divide between people who are, who are growing primarily for themselves and their families versus people who are um, growing for a larger population and in particular are selling what they produce. So as soon as money starts changing hands, that's when I start thinking about, um, about someone as a farmer if they're growing, uh, if they're growing agricultural products. Um, and that's not to say that growing for yourself is not important. It is vitally important. Um, but that's not something that I'm as able to help people with as, say, the master gardeners are, and vice versa. So what is a market garden? Um, when I was asked to talk about what to grow, I really wanted to zoom in on this type of urban farming um, because I think it's a really specialized, interesting concept, and it's, it's something that um, is very common in urban agriculture. Um, from what I've seen about the, uh, maybe two thirds of the urban farms I've visited could be described as a market garden. Um, they're relatively small scale farms that graze, that raise diversified vegetables and fruits, right? Many, many, many types of vegetables, dozens, um, you know, 50, 60 different types of vegetables and fruits on a very small lot, maybe one acre, maybe a quarter acre. Um, and then they directly market what they raise to their customers. Um, so they might sell it at a farm stand. They might um, have a CSA share where people, a community supported agriculture share where people can buy um, a share at the beginning of the season and then get um, a basket of vegetables every week throughout the growing season. They might sell at farmers markets. Um, they might sell directly to chefs uh, and restaurants. So those are, those are types of direct marketing uh, methods. Um, and this, this market garden uh, business, uh, this market bar garden type farm has been described in books in particular by two farmers, Elliot Coleman from Maine and Jean-Martin Fortier. I believe he's from Canada. Um, I went to school in Maine, so I'm more familiar with Elliot Coleman, but I've heard a lot of good things about Jean-Martin Fortier as well. And there are some others out there. So I, I'd like to talk today about deciding what to grow in this setting where you're growing at a small scale, um, a diverse amount of crops for your local market. And often, um, as you'll read in some of those books, market gardeners also feed uh, their families from these, these farms as well. So there's a, a piece of it that's marketing to your customers and there's a piece of it that's su supporting yourself. So before we dive into specific types of crops, I want to talk a little bit about how to decide what to grow. Um, because the question we get asked, and I think Shannon will back me up on this, but one of the questions we get asked the most is, what can I grow that will make me a lot of money? <laughs> and I, I hate to break it to you, but there is no one answer for that. Um, we're going to talk today about a bunch of different examples and how how those might fit into different systems, but there's no one thing that I can tell you, this is the magic crop that you will grow and it will make you lots of money and you can quit your day job. There's no answer to that question that is going to satisfy it, I'm sorry. Um, but I know it is really fun to think about the different crops that you, you might try raising. So what I'd like to do today is talk first a about how you might go about that, that decision um, and what questions to consider, and then dive into some specific examples of crops that people grow in urban market gardens and why they fit uh, based on those questions. So one important one is what do you want to eat? Um, um, the kind of the, the division between a garden and a market garden is that you sell what you produce, right? Uh, but often you'll be you'll be eating some of that too, and that's often a large piece of the motivation for people for doing this is, 
um, having access to, to fresh food that they want as well. So it's important to consider what you would want to eat when you choose what to grow. Um, but then, so these are, this is a, a production question. What can you grow efficiently with the resources and the space that you have, right? If you've got a quarter acre, maybe it doesn't make sense to raise pumpkins because they take up so much space. Although some folks, you know, figure out how to trellis squashes so that they're much more space efficient. Um, or if you have clay soils, maybe it doesn't make as much sense to raise carrots because those need sandy soils. Um, so thinking about what resources you have and what what your uh, your farm is suited to in terms of crops. Um, then thinking about who your customers are. Now we're getting into marketing questions. So who are your customers? Who are the people who are going to be buying what you grow and what do they want to buy locally? Um, not just what are they eating, um, but what do they want to buy not at their, you know, their wholesale gross grocery store if they have access to one of those, which not everyone does. But, you know, you might you might think people people eat a lot of potatoes, but maybe they're not willing to Maybe because potatoes are available so cheaply from the grocery store, they might not be willing to buy them at the farmer's market at the prices that are uh, economically viable for farmers, but they might be willing to buy fresh herbs. Um, so think about who your customers are and what they want to buy. Um, and also, you know, uh, are you selling to your neighbors? Um, are you selling at a farmer's market? Especially, a lot of urban farms have a a social mission as well, in addition to producing income for themselves. So they want to feed people in their community who don't have access, um, often don't have a lot of financial power uh, to buy healthy food. So that's something to, to think about. A lot of urban growers have kind of, um, I call it a Robin Hood business model, where they raise some crops that are popular among their uh, lower income community members and they sell those at a low price or even a subsidized price by selling other crops or maybe the same crops, but often other crops um, at a higher price to customers who have more money. Uh, so there are many different ways to answer the question of who your customer is and how that affects what you want to grow. Also start thinking about what you can grow that's not already available in the local market, um, right? If there are already four cut flower farms near you, um, maybe maybe there's enough, if there's already a, a couple of stalls selling cut flowers at the farmer's market, maybe there's not enough room for you to get in and start selling cut flowers, but maybe say there is a specialty um, herb that you grew up using in your, in your, your family's cuisine that's not available fresh um, locally. So that might be one way to um, kind of open up a new, a new niche. What can you grow that's best suited to direct marketing? Um, and this is one I find particularly interesting because there are some things that we grow, right, that store really well and that transport really well. So think about um, think about potatoes versus raspberries, right? Has it, people are getting better at it, but I 99 times out of 100, if I buy a raspberry from the grocery store, I am disappointed because <laughs> um, either it's not quite ripe or it's squishy. Um, so there are some crops that just don't transport well through the wholesale um, food system chain. So you can you have the possibility of raising it locally um, and getting it to your customers very quickly and getting them a, a product a food at a quality that they can't find anywhere else. Um, it's also important to think about what crops you could try growing that have ties to the local culture and history. Um, so that can be that can be a kind of added value to what you raise uh, that's not available for at the the national level food system, right? Um, so some farmers are raising fish peppers because they're a type of pepper. They're not fish, <laughs> um, but they're a type of pepper that has a history in Baltimore, and so people are are doing that because there's a story they can tell about it that is valuable to their local customers. And then here's a financial question that is really important. What can you sell at a price that will cover your costs? Um, and that's something that I know we have some webinars recorded on enterprise budgeting that you can you can start 
uh, examining this question there. I'm not going to get into it too much today, um, but it's important to think about paying yourself for your time. Um, I used to work, I keep ragging on potatoes. I know people who raise potatoes locally successfully, <laughs> um, but I did used to work on a, on a CSA farm where the farmer sat down and did an enterprise budget and realized that she was spending so much time digging potatoes, fixing the potato digging machine, um, you know, and the customers were not willing to buy the potatoes at a price that covered those costs, so she just stopped growing them. Um, whereas if you are selling to chefs, right, if that's your, if that's your goal, there might be um, some specialty fresh herbs that they're willing to purchase um, that are, you know, that their other sources sell for high prices. So those are able, those might be able to cover the cost, what it costs you to produce the crop. Um, another example of that, uh, and then I'll get off this this slide, so don't don't get bored yet. Um, is I used to work with uh, some vegetable growers, and one of them got really excited one day and came to me and said, "Hey, I've been selling uh, cucumbers at the farmers market." And it's going okay, but the local grocery store came to me and told me they will buy all of my cucumbers. And he was super excited about it. But then he sat down with an enterprise budget and he realized that because the local grocery store wanted to, to buy them from him at the wholesale price, right, he would actually be selling the cucumbers to the grocery store at a loss. So it would cost him more to produce the cucumbers than the grocery store was going to pay. So you you can't make up <laughs> that kind of loss by selling more at a volume. Then you're just losing more money. Um, so it's really important to think about what what type if you're trying to do this to produce income for yourself. It's important to think about what you can what prices people are willing to pay for what you grow, and whether the crop that you, what crop choosing the crops that you can grow that will you'll be able to sell at a price that will cover your cost of production. Especially also if you're trying to do that Robin Hood business model. Um, this is a, still another important question. Okay, so let's start diving into examples. Um, here's where we get to the fun part, uh, talking about specific crops. But I am going to emphasize again, there are no silver bullets. There's no one crop I can go to you and say, this is the one you got to grow. I've not met half of you. I don't know what your situations are. This is something you're going to have to weigh for yourself. Um, and honestly, if there was one crop you could grow that would make you a lot of money, probably people would be growing it already, right? Um, so you have to think about what's going to work for your situation, what's not already available in your market, all those questions we talked about. Um, but we can get into some examples now. Uh, I do want to bring you back to one piece of the definition of a market market garden, um, which is diversified production, right? Market gardening, part of the concept is that you grow a lot of different types of food. This picture of a CSA basket is a good example. Um, and this is kind of a tactic for managing risk as well. Um, if you have a bad year and your tomatoes don't grow like they did this summer when we got, what was it, 60, 70 inches of rain in Baltimore, um, if tomatoes were all you were growing, you would be sunk. Um, but if you're growing some other crops as well that can handle the rain a little bit better, everyone had a really terrible year, but that diversity does help a little bit, even in bad years. Um, and if your customers' tastes change, and you know, right now they're super excited about husk cherries, um, and then next year everyone, the, the wholesale grocery stores figured out how to get husk cherries into their market chain and they're selling at the grocery store for cheaper than you can sell. If you've still got a variety of other vegetables, you haven't put all your eggs in the husk cherry basket, right? Diversification is really important. Okay, so I'm going to start off by talking about kind of the more the more common types of vegetables and we're going to get, or types of uh, crops, and we're going to get to the weirder ones as we go or the more unusual ones. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. But one of the most common types of vegetables that are raised on urban market gardens are greens. And I tend to think of them as falling into the two buckets of the fresh greens that you put on salads and the cooking greens. Um, so fresh greens, things like lettuce, arugula, 
um, spinach and cooking greens might be older spinach, <laughs> um, Swiss chard, kale, collards. Um, these are these are things that work very well at the small scale. Um, as we go along, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some vegetables and about a, some, a few fruits as well. But an important concept when you're growing at a small scale, um, you know, less than 10 acres, less than an acre often on, in, on an urban farm, um, you only have so much ground to work with. So it's really important if you're trying to produce income to support yourself to try to, and if you're trying to produce food for people, right? Um, if you're trying to produce, but especially if you're trying to produce income, um, it's really important to think about using that ground very efficiently um, and raising something that will produce a lot of food in a small space and in a small amount of time. Um, so if you think of a fruit tree, there are situations in which raising a fruit tree on an urban urban lot makes sense, and we'll talk about some of them later. Um, but if you have good soil, whether you've brought it in or you, you're lucky to have started it with it, um, a fruit tree will take five years to start producing much fruit. And you, you get one harvest a year, and it's kind of it takes up a lot of space. And the same thing is true of um, pumpkins, as we talked about. They take up a lot of space, and you get like, you know, a certain number of pumpkins per square feet at the end of the season. They're there all season. Whereas things like greens, especially the fresh greens that we eat on salads, you get a lot of greens in a small amount of space and you can plant multiple crops in the same physical location at different times throughout the year. So that can be a very efficient way to use a small amount of space, which is one of the reasons why they're so popular um, with urban growers. The other reason, I think, is because greens are the kind of thing that are better fresh, right? I'm sure many, all of us have gone to the grocery store and sometimes the greens at the grocery store are beautiful and sometimes they're wilty and sad and you don't want to eat them. Um, so fresh greens are one of those things that you really can, if you, if you work at it, you can produce an extra good quality um, by getting them harvested into your customer really quickly. And there is some research on veg on things like that about some of the some of the vitamins breaking down over storage time. I think there's a professor at Cornell uh, who's done some research on that. So that's one of the reasons why greens are so popular. I will say though that the cooking greens, things like kale and collards, those do take a longer chunk of your growing season, and they are also heavy feeders, so they need a lot of nitrogen to grow successfully. Um, so that's something to consider. Tomatoes are another one that are super popular with urban growers, with direct marketing folks, um, and they're popular for a reason, right? They're another crop that is uh, a supermarket tomato is very sad, <laughs> um, right? Because in order to transport them from where, where they're grown somewhere else, they have to be picked green um, and then ripened as they're transported. So they just can't taste as good as a tomato that you grow yourself or that someone near you grows. Um, so there's an advantage in terms of quality for direct marketed tomatoes. The downside is that tomatoes are very sickly plants. They get lots of diseases. They especially get diseases when it rains because they are, are uh, um, likely to get the kinds of diseases that spread in water. Um, you know, the rain doesn't have the diseases in them, but when it splashes on the ground, it splashes the disease onto the tomato plants. Um, it helps the, the funguses germinate. It's rain is tomatoes' um, enemy, essentially, <laughs> in terms of diseases. So they're a risky crop sometimes to grow. Um, and if you're you're growing organically, um, there are some tools you can use, uh, but they're not. There are a limited number of tools you can use. Um, so I think tomatoes are one of those ones that are popular for a reason. People, if you're selling at a farmer's market, if you've got a CSA, people will expect you to have tomatoes. Um, but they're also another one to maybe not put all your eggs in that basket. Uh, you can also think about different varieties within the tomato, right? There's heirloom tomatoes. There's um, kind of more traditional varieties that are often used for canning. So there, there are ways you can use those different varieties to differentiate yourself 
um, from your competitors um, and sell a variety that no one else has. There are also different varieties that are more or less resistant to diseases. Um, and I've got this picture of a, a yellow cherry tomato because in particular the um, the sun go the sun sun sweet I think they're called I'm forgetting the name of the variety right now but there's a, a yellow cherry tomato variety that is particularly um, that I've found particularly disease resistant and so looking for those varieties that are disease resistant can can help you produce a product even in an un, unreliable climate. Um, I, I threw in Deliquata squash uh, because I wanted to talk a little bit about plants and crops that take up more space um, and thinking about situations in which it makes sense and which it doesn't. Um, so squashes in general, uh, you know, they sprawl, they take up a lot of space. And winter squashes like Delicata, like butternut, like pumpkins, they take a long time. You need to get them get your transplant started in the spring, get them out in the ground, usually in July, um, June, July. And then they kind of sit there and they grow bigger and bigger and then you harvest them in the fall. So they are a large investment in time and space. Um, they do, though, produce, you know, a lot of calories, right? They're, if you think about greens, you have to eat a lot of salads to get to survive. Um, but squashes are essentially a starch, right? So if you are, if your goal is to provide food for your community, um, you do need to start thinking about producing crops that produce a lot of calories. Um, but as we just talked about, squashes take up a lot of space. Um, so if that's something that's important to you, either from a marketing perspective, because your customers really want squashes, um, or from a, a food security perspective, it's, then you need to start thinking about ways to use the space most efficiently. Um, trellising is one thing people do with squashes. You wouldn't think it would work with some of the bigger ones, um, but if you trellis it from the beginning, their stem gets really thick, um, so it starts to support itself as it grows, and there are some nets that you can add to support them. Um, another option is to start developing partnerships with other farmers. There are a couple of rural farmers, like Good Dog Farm, started in the city, the farmers there, and now they're out in the county. Um, and they raise a lot of those space intensive things like potatoes and squashes and then they partner with urban farmers to um, add those crops to, to what the urban farmers are able to sell. So there are ways you can have urban and rural partnerships to get local uh, vegetables into your, your urban farm market. Um, but not have to grow all of them in the very limited space that you've got. Um, and I, I picked Delicata in particular because I think it is particularly delicious. <laughs> um, and it's a relatively small winter squash. So even as you're thinking about different squashes, think about the different squash varieties. What, what varieties are not available currently in your market, especially what varieties are not available in the grocery store. So when you bring them into the farmer's market, people are like, oh, this is new and exciting. Right, um, and also think about those those summer squashes. Um, those do you know they produce a lot uh, very quickly in the summer. They don't take as long as the winter squashes, um, but some people uh, don't enjoy them as much. And sometimes you know everyone there's the joke about the bag of zucchini left on left orphaned on the doorstep. Um, so that, that, that's something to think about whether people have enough of those already or not. Garlic is another um, kind of traditional vegetable crop that can fit into an urban market garden. This is actually a picture from my parents' house <laughs> um, of garlic drying in their shed. Um, and that's a, garlic is a crop that can kind of fit into, into the odd shoulders of the year and odd, odd gaps in your rotation. You plant garlic in the fall, kind of just before the, the ground freezes, um, and then you harvest it late the following spring. Um, so it does take up part of the traditional growing season, but it can fit in depending on what other crops you're raising. Um, and uh, um, there are, I should point out, there are northern varieties of garlic, there are southern varieties of garlic here in the Mid-Atlantic. We're kind of on the middle, so just be careful what variety you're getting. And I would not recommend buying garlic from the grocery store and planting it 
for one because it's going to be a lot more expensive um, buying at wholesale, buying it at retail prices um, for seed, and for another because uh, disease is a uh, disease and seed source is really important, especially with garlic because you know there's always a little bit of um, there's always a little bit of soil left, and you don't want to import diseases to your site from seed that was not that was designed for eating, um, not designed for planting. So I should say plant diseases, they're not going to hurt people, right? But they might infect your crop. Um, and as an example, here is a, a, a diseased garlic plant. And some garlic diseases, once they're in the soil, they're there. So you just can't grow garlic there anymore. Um, so that's just an important thing to point out, to be careful where you get your garlic source, seed source. You know, they're not actually seeds, they're just cloves of garlic. but be careful with that. Um, sweet potatoes are another vegetable crop. We've talked a lot about, you know, do you grow potatoes? Do you not grow potatoes in a small space? I think this is particularly interesting because um, the Greener Garden in Baltimore, they're raising sweet potatoes um, and they're kind of getting two crops out of it because they're, they're getting the potatoes, the, the, the tubers that people eat, right? Um, but they also have some customers who are from from the Caribbean who eat sweet potato greens. Um, they cook them down kind of like spinach. And um, they're actually willing to come out and pick the, the greens. Um, so depending on who your customer is again, right, there might be uses for other parts of the crop than is traditionally uh, used in the US. Edamame is another kind of unusual vegetable crop. Um, it's just soybeans, but it's kind of a, a variety, a slightly different variety of soybeans than is usually raised for grain. Um, edamame is common in Japanese cuisines. You boil them in salty water and then you, you eat them, you kind of squeeze them out of the pod with your mouth. It's a very fun activity, especially if you're having a beer and watching a game. Um, and uh, soybeans are a nitrogen fixer, so they can be a nice, a nice thing to add into your rotation. So I just wanted to throw that out there as an interesting crop um, that might fit in in odd places in your crop rotation and in your crop planning. Herbs are another. So we're kind of shifting away from the the sort of vegetable crops now into herbs, and then I'm going to talk about fruits. Um, and I should say this is by no means a comprehensive list of things you could grow, right? There are, I could just list things for this entire hour and there would still be types of crops we could talk about that are left. Um, I'm just picking a few highlights to talk about, help us think about the different, different questions we talked about earlier, right? Um, so herbs are another, another type of crop that are very popular in urban market gardening because um, Fresh herbs, again, are something that sometimes can be hard to get good quality in your grocery store um, because people who enjoy cooking often, you know, think about who your customer is, right? If you're selling at a farmer's market, people who shop at farmer's markets often are people who really enjoy cooking and they want um, really good quality ingredients for their cooking. And people who enjoy cooking and, and want quality ingredients often are using herbs in their cooking as well and fresh herbs. Um, Similarly, if you're selling to chefs and restaurants, they often buy a lot of herbs, excuse me, for, for their cooking, their fine dining. This is just from my garden. I'm sorry, I couldn't get you a better picture. So don't, usually they're sold in bunches, not in Tupperwares. <laughs> uh, but on the left, we've got dill and then cilantro. And those are actually some of the fresh greens. Those are not herbs. There's arugula and spinach. Um, but there are a lot of different herbs and some that might be one area where you can specialize. Some urban growers specialize in producing a variety of herbs that are not commonly available. Dill and cilantro and basil, those are probably available at every farmer's market, but there are some more unusual herbs, um, things like culantro, um, things like um, chervil or tarragon or salsify um, that are kind of more old fashioned and not raised as much commercially anymore. Um, so you can, that's another way to explore a niche that might not already be filled in your market. Um, and that's something you can talk with your customers if you already have a market stand. What, you know, what did you eat growing up that you don't find anymore and you miss? 
You can talk to your chef customers. What what herbs do you wish you could try out that you're not getting from your current suppliers? Um, or what what are you getting from your current suppliers and you just don't like the quality of? So those are those are ways you can do market research on niches that might be open for you to fill. Um, important points about raising herbs: um, they are also very efficient on a small small space. Um, you can get multiple cuttings of them over a season. So that's one of the reasons why they're popular. Um, some herbs, though, are kind of limited to the cool part of the season, like dill and cilantro. You can grow them in the spring and the fall here in Maryland, but in the summer they're going to bolt. They're going to start flowering. They're going to taste terrible, so you can't grow them all through the year unless you do some, some really clever <laughs> uh, production strategies that people are still kind of trying out. Um, similarly, things like basil, those need heat uh, to grow, so they grow best in the middle of the year. Um, and then other herbs are perennials. Uh, things like rosemary and um, thyme. Um, so those you might be able, rosemary does tend to, to sometimes die off in the winter when it gets as cold as it is right now, so that's a risk. Um, but you might be able to get a perennial herb garden established. And if you are a chef yourself, a chef's herb garden is a very popular um, kind of mini urban farm. One thing I should mention is mint. I would highly recommend you do not plant mint in the ground <laughs> because it will very quickly become a weed and you will have more mint than you know what to do with. More mint than you could ever drink in mint tulips at the Preakness, right? Um, so I would say keep your mint to containers. It'll save you a lot of headaches. Um, I just wanted to pull out one example of, an, of a kind of uh, ethnic specialty herb. Um, shiso, this is, this is raised, I took this photo at Karma Farms. Um, this is a, a, an herb that is used as a divider in bento boxes in Japanese cuisine. Um, so there are herbs like this. I'm not saying everyone should go, go, go grow shiso. I'm using this as an example of there are herbs that you can find that maybe are part of your, your heritage and culinary background or, um, are just herbs that are your customers can't find um, from their traditional sources. So think about that in terms of what your customer, who your customers are, what they're willing to pay for, um, and what's not already available in your market. Hibiscus. Um, let's see. This is a, a couple of our land grant researchers, Corey Cotton at University of Maryland Eastern Shore, is doing some really cool research on raising hibiscus. Um, that's another. Um, kind of ethnic heritage crop raised by people um, from the Caribbean in particular. Um, and they, they use the flowers to make a tea. It's very delicious. It's one of those um, kind of like pomegranate. It's one of those things that people get really excited about potential health benefits for. But I'm going to mention, um, and if you ever go to one of Ginger's food for profit classes, it's really important not to make health claims on your labels unless you have can really back them up with science because <laughs> the FDA will not like that. Um, so I think it's it's a good idea to kind of explore crops that your customers might be excited about for those reasons, but be careful how you market things that are that people are excited about for health reasons because you really don't want to mislead anybody. Um, and I'm not saying that there are not health benefits, right? I'm just saying don't make the FDA angry, right? <laughs> um, no, be able to back up any claims. Um, bitter melon is another of those uh, kind of specialty um, heritage crops that have traditional medicinal uses, um, particularly in Asian cuisine. Um, and this is an example of uh, the, the bitter melon being trellised at real food farm. So again, this might be something to grow depending on who your customers are, what they're able to find elsewhere, and what, what you can bring to the table, right? Like if you have a certain heritage and story, if, you're, if your parents are immigrants from a certain country um, and you're selling you know, the vegetables from your heritage, that can be a really cool story to tell at your farmer's market stand. Um, and it can kind of help your customers 
uh, identify with you a little bit more and enjoy purchasing from you. So if, if there's a, there are, you can also think about what you grow in terms of what story you can tell about them. Specialty peppers are another one that are that are popular um, with market gardening. There are so many varieties of peppers. There are hot peppers. There are sweet peppers. There are mild peppers. Um, there are um, super hot peppers. <laughs> um, these, I think, is a bird's beak pepper. I do not know all of the, vari the varieties, but I think um, hot sauce making is becoming one of those hobbies, kind of like craft brewing, um, where there is a market for people who get really excited about their hobby of making hot sauce and they want to go out and find um, all the different rare, unusual hot peppers that they can then put into their hot sauces. So there might be a market there um, of people who are willing to pay a little bit extra for a pepper that isn't available at their regular grocery store. So that's another thing you can start looking into when you start researching who your customers are and what they value. Raspberries we talked about already. We're going to start getting into fruits now. Um, raspberries are uh, one of those ones that are relatively Raspberries and blackberries, right, they, they, there are varieties now that are much more domesticated and don't have thorns, um, but in general, they're, they're pretty tough crops. They're relatively hardy, but the fruits themselves are very, very fragile. And we talked about how um, it's, it's difficult to get a good raspberry in a grocery store, whereas if you pick them very quickly and get them to your customers very quickly, you can get them a product that is a beautiful quality that they can't find anywhere else. That can be one thing that differentiates you, right? So think about crops that are not available in the quality that your customers want elsewhere. The downside, though, is that they require very careful picking, right? Very gentle, takes a long time. That's a lot of labor. Um, and we want you want to be able to pay yourself for your time. That's, that's really important. So that's one potential downside to consider. Um, that also feeds into agritourism and starting to talk about agritourism and bringing people to your farm to experience where their food comes from and to pick it themselves. Pick your own is a type of agritourism. Um, so crops like raspberries, like snap beans, um, that are very laborious to pick and take a lot of the farmer's labor to pick might lend themselves particularly well to a pick-your-own agritourism venture. Figs are another type of fruit that are uh, increasingly popular on urban market gardens. Um, there was a great talk that I, I unfortunately had to miss at the Future Harvest Conference on fig production, um, but here are two, two different farms that have figs in Baltimore, and I think Again, these are crops where you you they're ripe for they're perfectly ripe for a very short amount of time, and when they are ripe, they are very fragile. Uh, so this is another example of a fruit that is has a quality benefit from being locally produced. Um, the downside is, you know, they take up a lot of space, and it's the one thing there for years on end. Um, However, figs, you know, they, they, when they get going, they produce a lot of figs. Um, we are kind of on the, the weird margin, like the southern end of their range, so it's important to choose a variety that is hardy. Um, I mean, we're, sorry, we're on the northern end of their range, that's it. We're on the northern end of the fig range, so they might die back when, if we have a cold winter. They're certainly going to die back towards the ground, um, but you might have some damage and loss of the roots even in a really cold winter. So it's important to choose hardy varieties um, and to mulch them properly and plant them in a protected place, like uh, near a building. That's one of the advantages of our urban heat island, right? All that concrete stores heat during the day and releases it at night, so it never gets quite as cold in a city as it does in the country nearby. That's the heat island effect. So that's one thing you can take an advantage of, that you can take advantage of in an urban market garden. Um, is growing crops that are a little bit too far north, <laughs> but it's a little bit warmer in the city, right? Um, and so that's this sort of, as we start talking about fruits, this also brings us into the conversation of when does raising a perennial crop 
make sense at a small scale, right? Um, because as we talked about, if you've got less than an acre to work with, that's a very small amount of space. And if you're trying to do diversified production, you're trying to produce as much as possible. You're trying to produce a wide variety of things. You're trying to produce things quickly that will pay for your time. Um, a perennial fruit tree is a huge investment of space and time. Um, situations in which it might make sense are, you know, if perennials, um, they do require maintenance, they do require your labor, they require pruning, um, they require harvesting, um, they require um, some scouting and management for diseases and pests, they might require netting to keep birds off, um, but they can be a little bit left alone a little bit more than some of your faster growing crops, like, say, lettuce or cilantro, right, which you, because you need to, which you need to be looking at pretty much every day <laughs> or at least several times a week, right? Um, so if you've kind of reached your capacity in terms of time on part of your space, it might make sense to plant something perennial on the other part um, that you can check in on less frequently. Um, the other piece is if, if um, you're raising a fruit that's not available, in your local market, right? Like we talked about, you've identified a niche. Um, or especially, we I, I get a lot of questions from urban growers and from other people about contamination concerns and risks um, in urban soils. And, that, and um, metal contamination, lead contamination is a risk. It's something you should test for. It's not a problem on all sites, right? I want to make sure I'm not scaring people more than is necessary. Um, so I'd say get your soil tested. Um, but don't, don't think that all urban soils are contaminated because that's not true, right? Um, but if you are growing, if, if you are growing on a site that has um, lead contamination, one risk management strategy you can use is to convert to uh, perennial crops like fruit trees that, you know, you plant them once and then you don't disturb the soil anymore. So with lead in particular, um, at normal pH, it binds really tightly to the soil. So the most important thing with lead contaminated soil is to keep the soil itself out of human beings, right? Um, and you, you get exposed to it when you till the soil with the dust, the farmer gets exposed to it. And um, with certain crops like root crops or like lettuces, where you tend to get grit in the, so in the crop itself, that's one route of exposure, right? So if you can eliminate those routes of exposure by planting something like a fruit tree where you don't disturb the soil anymore. Oh, I think I saw a question, but it disappeared. Um, Shannon, let me know what that question was, if you wouldn't mind. Um, and I'll, I'll keep on going until then. Yeah, there was um, there was a question about your event that's coming up Sunday. So I shared that. Um, there is a question about reliable seed providers or nurseries uh, for recommendation, like for specialty plants mm. or traditional that you like to bring back to the local market. So um, thank you. There. Yeah, thank you very much. That's a good question. A question about finding uh, seed providers um, for specialty crops, reliable providers. Um, let's see. So there's there's a couple kind of standards, right? There's Everyone uses Johnny's and high mowing, um, and they do have quite a wide variety. Um, for more unusual things, um, there's Cornell has a spinoff I think called Row Nine, where they breed some more some new and unusual vegetable varieties. Um, I think using traditional breeding techniques, so they can be a cool place to check out. Row Nine, I think they're called. I might be getting that wrong. They're out of Cornell. Um, our local land grants do crop breeding as well, right? Um, our, our local uh, professor, Dr. Chris, Wal Chris Walsh, he's been working on a new apple variety adapted to the Maryland climate, which you might have heard about on the news recently. It's not available yet, but it will be eventually. Um, fruit, in particular, Johnny's and high mowing doesn't tend to provide. Um, I've been buying my own fruit trees from, um, uh, shoot, Starks. Yeah, I think it's Stark, Stark Brothers. Um, but there are a lot of others out there. Um, it, in, there are a couple of, oh, we also in Baltimore, of course, we have our local 
our local seed company, um, which I'm blanking on at the moment, um, which is embarrassing. They're right here in Baltimore City. We've got a seed catalog somewhere on my on my shelf. Um, Myers, I saw that. Thank you, Myers. They're, they're our local seed company in Baltimore. They've got some cool heirloom varieties. Um, a couple of important points about finding seed. Um, some folks like to raise um, one kind of new unusual enterprise that I don't have a picture of, unfortunately, right now. I forgot to add it in, um, is ginger and turmeric. People raise those in high tunnels in the summer, actually, because those are tropical crops. Um, they really love the heat. So the heat that you get in a high tunnel in the summer, when you usually have trouble keeping crops alive in a high tunnel, is actually perfect for things like turmeric and ginger. Um, but, and there, that's not something that's usually locally available, so that's been an interesting niche for people to fill. The challenge there is that if you're growing organically, um, clean, organic, disease-free organic ginger uh, seed is not quite the right word. It's little pieces of root can be very difficult to find. Um, so I don't have any great advice for you on that. I know um, people can be a little secretive about where they get their ginger and turmeric seed or rootlets. Um, some of them come out of Hawaii, uh, but that's just something to be aware of that if, if that's what you're that's what you're looking to grow get started now trying to find the source. <laughs> and if anyone has any other favorite seed sources, do throw them into the chat pod. I would love to, to hear about them, and I think everyone else would as well. Um, oh, here is our colleague, uh, Andrew Ristvi, uh, with the aronia berries that he's been working on. Awesome, I'm glad that was helpful. Um, there, this is where, where I've got a couple of slides about native fruits, right? And that's kind of another, another niche, another story, right? It's, it's adding value to your crops to have the story about, you know, this is a fruit that is native to our region. Uh, it used to grow here naturally. We've kind of pushed it out. Now we're bringing it back. Hudson Valley Seed Company in New York, I see someone mentioned. Awesome. Um, so aronia is a, a local native crop that um, our colleague, Dr. Ristby, has been working on. And some of these native crops are relatively tough and hardy, um, so they can be relatively resistant to diseases, which can be beneficial in terms of the amount of time you need to manage them. Um, the challenge, though, is usually that the customers are not used to eating them. Um, so you get, you get kind of the, the balance of right bringing in something new can be really exciting for your customers, but it also can require some education on how to use it how to cook it. Um, so those are kind of the pros and cons of new native fruit crops. And similarly, pawpaw, oh, we are, oh, we're running out of time, but I think we've only got a couple slides left. Pawpaw is another native fruit that people are getting real excited about. Um, it's also, it's, uh, it's got a very, it's also ripe for a very short amount of time, and it's got a very soft texture when it's ripe. Um, but it is kind of tropical fruit flavored, and it's I think the biggest native fruit in the U.S. Um, so it's it's kind of got an unusual market niche there. But again, this is a, a tree crop. It gets to be very big, um, so it might not be a fit for all urban market garden sites. Hops. I apologize. I can't remember the name of this gentleman. Um, he he spoke at the Small Farms Conference back in 2016 in this delightful hops costume. And all I remember is that he was the Virginia hops guy. <laughs> um, but hops are another crop that people are getting real excited about right now. And again, uh, Dr. Rispy and another colleague of ours, Brian Butler, actually, he's doing a lot of the research on it right now, Brian Butler, on um, raising hops in Maryland. Um, again, I think hops might be a crop that might not make a lot of sense at a very small scale, but you might want to grow some hops for yourself if you're a home brewer. So, you know, um, I would say don't don't invest too much money in hops if you've got less than an acre, right? Don't don't throw all your eggs into that basket. I would say, um, but it could be fun to explore. Um, and we are working on in at Maryland on doing research on what varieties grow best in our region and what management practices are best for our climate, because there are some diseases in our nice wet climate um, that hops get that we're trying to figure out how best to manage. Mushrooms. 
are another kind of cool specialty crop. We're starting to get into the weird stuff. I love mushrooms. Um, they can be grown indoors on um, sawdust or grain, like uh, the picture on your left. They can be grown outdoors on logs. Um, the indoor variety is a lot faster, um, but it also requires a lot of kind of very, very meticulous management. Um, the outdoor variety is slower, um, but sometimes people enjoy that and it makes use of a woodland space that might not otherwise be useful. Um, and people will argue very passionately about which one tastes better, and I don't have a dog in that race, um, but I think mushrooms are a cool crop to consider. Flowers are another one that are very popular. We talked a little bit at the beginning about how there are a lot of cut flower growers out there right now. There's been a bit of a boom. Um, this is a picture of Uptop Acres in, in Washington, D.C. They're a rooftop urban farm. Um, they mostly grow vegetables, but they've got a few flowers, and agritourism is a very big part of their business model, right? Um, so having a beautiful farm is important if you're trying to do agritourism, if you're trying to get people excited about coming out to your farm, especially to have events like weddings or parties um, or just to hang out or doing photo shoots. So flowers can be a piece of that as well. Um, and again, cut flowers can make sense for a site where you don't want to disturb the soil for one reason or another. So those are all the slides I've got. I think we have about a couple minutes left for questions. Um, I've got some links here to books that are very helpful for market gardeners um, and resources for more information about the different types of crops that we talked about. Um, and in particular, I'd like to encourage, if you did not see our previous webinar on using a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, to evaluate different enterprises, I'd encourage you after this class to go back and look at that. Um, because as we talked about, there's no one crop that's right for everyone. So it, that tool can help you start digging in a little bit more into what's right for your situation. Um, I also am going to ask if you wouldn't, if you would do me the favor of sharing some feedback. I am a public servant. You are the public. You get to tell me how well I'm doing my job. Um, so this, this link, which I'll put into the chat pod, will take you to a very short survey. Um, there are six questions. And the first question is my name. <laughs> and the next one is the date. Um, and the third one is what topic I was ta speaking on. So I'm going to say today's topic is crop production. Um, that's one of the options available. So I'll throw that into the chat pod. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And I'll put the links into the chat pod. All right, are there any questions for Nia? And I didn't type the uh I didn't type your uh oh yeah, link in there. I put two U EDUs. That's what I get for typing instead of copying and pasting. Okay. I'll fix that then. Oh, thank you. Got it fixed. Thank you, Shannon. That's it. Okay. All right. I'm having a little trouble. My mouse has disappeared. So you'll get, I think you'll get, um, oh, there we go. I can highlight these. I'm going to send you the, the other resource links as well in the chat pod, but do please take time to fill out that, um, that survey. And I think you will also get uh, access to the slides on the Women in Agriculture website. All right, we've got some good feedback about today's meeting, uh, today's webinar. Uh, any additional questions, um, definitely use the uh, chat pod if you had some specific questions for Nia. Um, the recording should be available in the next 24 to 48 hours. We'll get that loaded and the link sent out so you can view it, as well as the slides. Um, those will be available, too, on the website. So any additional questions for Nia? All right, I'm going to stop recording.